Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the final panel of Witch Digital 2021 called Sharing Creative Journeys Through Music and Tech. After my introductions, we'll have a 45 minute panel with about 15 minutes of questions. Please do make sure that you post your questions into the Q&A box. We cannot take them from the chat box. And now I'd like to introduce our stunning panelists this evening. First up, Kayla Painter. Kayla Painter is an experimental artist and producer. Fragmented beats heading towards uncharted musical territories, say Crack magazine. Painter's immersive and ever-evolving AV performances are a natural consequence of the entire writing process. The AV show has appeared at Glastonbury, The Great Escape, Camp Elsewhere, Blue Dot and We Out Here festivals. Supported through Giles Peterson's Future Bubblers Talent Development Programme, Kayla has made a lasting impact on tastemakers. She has crafted remixes for a string of well-regarded acts, written music for Disney, Channel 4, Discovery Channel and a range of independent films, as well as having been commissioned by Universal Publishing for Sync. Kayla is an associate lecturer at Bath Spa University and has a monthly show on Worldwide FM called Connections to Sound. 2021 will see a much anticipated EP release. Following the release, a brand new 3D live show will be toured. Hannah Peel. Hannah Peel is a Northern Irish artist, composer, producer and broadcaster. Often inspired by the connections between science and music, her solo record career includes the album Awake But Always Dreaming, which became an ode to her grandmother's mind as she lived with dementia. The electronic ruralism of Chalk Hill Blue, an album recorded with the poet Will Burns, and connecting our brains and neurons to the stars in our solar system with the space-themed Mary Cassio, Journey to Cassiopeia, scored for synthesizers and 30-piece colliery brass band. In 2019, Peel composed and recorded the soundtrack for Game of Thrones The Last Watch, which earned her an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Music Composition for a Documentary Series or Special Original Dramatic Score. A year later, she created the soundtrack for the excellent BBC documentary Lee Miller, A Life on the Frontline, and scored the four-part Channel 5 TV thriller The Deceived. In March 2021, she released a new electronic album, Fur Ray Wave, to critical acclaim where she rebuilt and redefined the music of Delia Derbyshire and the Radiophonic Workshop by reinterpreting the original music of the celebrated 1972 KPM 1000 series Electrosonic and only weeks later recorded a collaborative record with the Para Orchestra, details of which will be announced later this year. Hannah is also a regular presenter on the BBC Radio 3 show Night Tracks, and you can find all of their links in the chat. Laurie Anderson is one of America's most renowned and daring creative pioneers best known for her multimedia presentations, innovative use of technology and first-person style. She is a writer, director, visual artist and vocalist who has created groundbreaking works that span the worlds of art, theatre and experimental music. Her recording career, launched by O oh Superman in 1981, includes many records and releases by Warner Records, among them Big Science from 1982, the soundtrack to her feature film Home of the Brave in 1986, Strange Angels in 1989, Life on a String in 2000, Homeland in 2008 and Landfall in 2018 released on Nonsuch, which recently won a Grammy Award in 2019 for Best Chamber Music and Small Ensemble Performance. Hello and welcome to you all. Laurie, how are you feeling? Are you feeling hopeful now that lockdowns are slowly lifting in the UK and the US? I was feeling hopeful in the pandemic. Oh, great. Uh, I'm not that <clears throat> uh, happy actually about jumping back onto the big, busy super highway of 
culture. I loved having this time of solitude. So I, I'm really thinking about how to do it, how to keep a lot of that energy from that time and bring it into this one. How about you? Um, well, likewise, I've been staying very creative in, in my studio and I've connected to a lot of people during this time and a lot of great practices and, and sort of rituals. But um, and that that balance between staying creative and not getting sucked into the endless rush. Um, have you stayed mostly in New York or, or, or were you outside of, of the city? Well, I have a, um, a place near the ocean, so I've gotten to know the birds pretty well. And my little dog is um, having a love affair with a 300 pound deer. <laughs> that happen out in the woods. Um, so it, it's, it's relaxing. Yeah. And maybe Kayla and Hannah, how like how are you feeling? Have you found this period very reflective? It, it, you know, are you feeling, you know, were you feeling hopeful throughout the three lockdowns we've had in the UK? Who wants to go first? Kayla, you go first. Oh, OK. Um, I think at the beginning, I found myself really creative, like feeling very creative because all the shows have been cancelled. Um, you know, all the gigs I had lined up and I needed somewhere for that to go. And so it just went into writing. And that was really lovely in a way because it just didn't feel like I'd lost anything. Um, but I suppose ups and downs. And I think, you know, when it got to lockdown three, I think things became a bit different. And I think my perspective changed and my patience started to um, really run out. But I think there has been a lot of kind of lessons I've learned in that time. So I suppose, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how things change or, or stay similar to, you know, certain lockdowns in terms of like communication with people through Zoom um, and that kind of thing. But I'm also very excited to get back on the stage later this year. Brilliant. And Hannah, I know you've been very um, productive in, in, in lockdown. How are you feeling about everything? Because you're also by the sea in oh, Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, I've loved being by the sea. It's been amazing. Um, yeah, I guess reflective, but only in the first few weeks. And then after that, it was just been manic and nonstop. So, um, you know, I, I guess I think the one thing I've noticed is the fact that because we're not traveling as much, I can fit more into the day. So that means that more kind of things are happening during the day. But um, I guess one of the, the massive things that I found was the connecting with people and people I never thought that I would be able to like even doing this with you guys and Laurie and and um, doing a lot of the curating for night tracks on Radio 3 and uh, meeting so many artists and hearing so much new music and uh, music that wasn't really ever might not have even been released had it not been a pandemic, like things that people had in their back pockets that might never have been considered, but because they can't do it live, they've released some kind of music that maybe just al is allowed to be recorded and released in that way. So, um, so yeah, I've loved it in, in a certain sense, and I'm a little bit kind of reluctant to, to get back into the swing of things for sure. I know exactly what you mean. Laurie, I heard on Adam Buxton's podcast, you said that during this time you've connected with, you know, many people over the past year. What's been the most enjoyable element of this for you? Oh, well, um, realising that you actually could have a conversation um, on Zoom that was meaningful, you know, and, and I, I hadn't been so sure that would happen <clears throat> but i have a very big family and um lots of brothers and sisters and uh we've gotten to know each other more in the last year on zooms than ever and so i really i really treasure that i mean it, it's a little bit lame you know you're in, in your box but um uh there are plenty of things that you can do so I think that part um, is going to uh, be part of the future of interchanges because you don't have to do everything in person. So I think we're just trying to figure out what, um, how we can 
keep those connections going. And at the same time, um, realize, oh, that one I really have to see uh, in 3D. Yeah. Cool. And um, you were hosting, um, was it a podcast series or, or a radio series called Party in the Bardo? Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, that was a... <clears throat> a uh, my, it came from my fantasy of that I've had it my whole life of wanting to live in San Francisco and getting up at like 3 a.m. and like driving through the fog to the radio station. And I would have a, <clears throat> a kind of uh, late night, early morning, four, it starts at 4 a.m. Um, before drive time, just to, at the point when people are really vulnerable, they're still in their dreams and they're not and they're making different connections and i would just play a lot of music and talk and um and be in no rush you know so um so when the pandemic hit i was doing a project at at a university and i said well let's just make it a this radio show so it was uh came on at 4 a.m it had you know three listeners and um we did eventually redo it, but I, I love things that aren't available 24 hours. Um, and I, I love things that are just happening at a certain time um, because it, that, it was made for that time of extreme vulnerability. And it was called the Bardo, Party in the Bardo, because it felt this, the Bardo in the Tibetan Book of the Dead is this 49 day period after death when the consciousness is is in a great deal of let's say turmoil really and excitement also and and it's as it becomes uh, another uh life form let's say so uh i felt that 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 transitional and you don't know what's happening it's very confusing so i thought this is the pandemic uh, uh new york was was hit very, very hard, very early. And um, quite a few of my friends died. So it was not, uh, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to say earlier how great the pandemic was. It was really, um, they weren't really ready to die, let's say. So it was very tough. And uh, so I played a lot of music that would help, that helped me um, uh, go into a um a mode that you know in which i recognize the kind of illusory nature of everything and and uh uh yeah so so that that was that project and and just it went on for and it was really talking with friends i would invite one person to come and talk about music what do you what do you like to to listen to and i i wish i could do that with all my friends because i got to know these people so well, when you say what 15 pieces of music do you love? And they tell you that and it's, you're like, what? Um, it's I highly recommend it. I've asked my friends to do that for me now just to make a playlist to just spend five minutes to it's not a big thing, but just make that playlist. And then I listen to them and I, I understand them in different ways, maybe not, you know, really understand them. Who knows if we understand anybody, even ourselves, but <laughs> You know, it gave me some insight into kind of who they were. Sorry, the answer was a little too long. <laughs> oh, no, I loved it. Um, I was lucky enough. I, I, I managed to find links where I listened to the conversation between you and Marina Abramovich and the one with you and Anoni. Um, and it was just glorious. And then and then it all sort of vanished into thin air, but you know, it, it, I, I couldn't yeah. find the links. So maybe that was the point, but I'm so lucky that I managed to manage to listen to, to some of them. Um, I just wanted to come on to a question. So 2021 marks 40 years since the release of Big Science, and this was co-produced with Roma Baran. I can think of only a handful of female record producers in that era who were in the major label system, you know, Joan Armour Trading and, and, and Kate Bush as great examples. How did you meet Roma Baran? And is there like a lovely memory you can share of, of making the record with her? Um, 
Well, let's see. I think I probably met Roma in a club uh, because I was doing stuff in clubs. And uh, and I did not want to make a record. Um, <laughs> I wasn't really interested in it. And um, But people, uh, at that time, people in, from record companies were coming around to these types of shows in downtown New York. And uh, so she was part of a group that was, was hanging out there and kind of going, you should make a record. And we're from Warner Brothers. We want to really make a record. And I was like, I don't want to make it. I, The re reason I didn't want to was um, um, I thought pop culture was stupid. You know, I was a, um, and it was kind of at the moment, a lot of it was at that time. And also because I'm a snob, you know, I just thought it was dumb. And, um, and then, uh, then I had a kind of turnaround because I was a sculptor at the time also. Mm. And it was just at the time when the art world sort of exploded and, and, and people began, you know, uh, seeing it as a kind of a money opportunity, you know, so, uh, um, you'd get into this world of like, um, big productions. And then I thought, well, you know what, who doesn't do that is records. You can make a record and anyone can buy it for a small amount of money and they have your artwork. And I thought, ding, bingo, that's, not, that's what I want to do. So, so I, um, uh, but I sort of got into it backwards because I was doing my own, uh, uh, I had my own little record company. And so if, if anybody wanted that uh, record Superman, they would write to me a postcard or whatever. And I would say, um, yeah, make the order. And then I would put the record in a envelope and walk to the post office and send it out. So then I, I um, and it was just a thing I did. It was, you know, and <clears throat> then I got a call from John Peel and he said, I need some records. I said, great. How many do you need? And he said, I need 40,000 on Friday. I need 40,000 more on Monday. I said, <laughs> right. Uh, okay. This is a lot of trips to the post office. So I called those people at Warner's and I said, you know, that, you know, that thing, uh, maybe we, you can press some rec records for me. And they, they were like, that's not the way we do things at Warner Brothers Records. Davis. You, you sign a contract and blah, blah, blah. You know, I was like, oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> but um, I kind of went ahead and did it and not thinking I would actually uh, go through with it really. <laughs> just, it was a kind of, a, just sort of uh, thing I needed to have done at the moment. So, but then I, I actually turned out, it turned out that I really liked those people. And then I met Roma, Roma Baron at a club and, and they said, uh, uh, why don't you uh, work with me on uh, getting this stuff out? And so that's, that's what we did. It was very, um, uh, very informal. And, um, and uh, you know, when you get something you don't necessarily want, it's a different kind of getting than something like I really want to make a record. So I was really happy to do it, but I, I, um, and, uh, and sometimes I make records now, but it's not a thing that, that, uh, oh, well, you know, you know how it is. If you, if you, uh, uh, have a dream to do something like my dream to do the late night radio show, that really was a thing for me. I was like, well, I get to do that now. So depends on what your dream is. Well, my dream was to curate and put on this festival. So, you know, I've been, I've been floating, really. No, I mean, I mean, you know, um, sincerely. Um, I just wanted to talk about your recent Norton lecture where you talk about the VR piece Chalk Room with Sin Shin Huang, um, saying, in the VR, you are the actor, the creator and the dream. And I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but you're, you were talked about breaking gaming rules, wandering and getting lost. So I wanted to open this up to Hannah and Kayla. How do you wander and get lost in your creative process? Hannah, you go first. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I honestly don't know. Um, I guess. I guess there's a moment where you are looking into something and you have no idea why you're looking into it. So um, the record that I've just made with the power orchestra, I was really obsessed with rocks and I had no idea why I was just obsessed with kind of geographical forms and rocks and and 
and the, the sound of them. And I was even asking kind of like sound recordist, uh, Chris Watson, like, do sock, do socks sing, <laughs> do, <laughs> do rocks sing. And, um, and, you know, exploring that idea, I did an R and D with the orchestra, but what came of it was the fact that I live by the sea. And I guess what that beauty of getting lost in a moment or an idea or a theme was that, that moment where you, you do pick up a pebble and you are, kind of holding something that has been formed by the earth and by the planet that's taken th maybe thousands of years to get to that shape. And there was a moment there that made me so excited to kind of fuse that feeling of like, I don't, like this kind of gut wrenching feeling of like, what I want to do this, but I have no idea. And then the realization that there is something that you can tap into that's human and, and more emotional and then taps into further than to actually what you're going through. So I guess that's how I get lost in a lot of things. And also, you know, I really miss dancing, actually what you were saying, Laurie, about clubbing and, <laughs> oh my God, like just being with people and being at a gig and just getting your head lost in that moment is just, yeah, I can't wait to go back and do that. <laughs> Yeah, like I absolutely hear you, Hannah. I mean, every Saturday night, that's like a going out night and it's like, oh God, I, I can't go anywhere. Like. You know, Zoom DJ sets just don't really cut it. Um, Kayla, how do you wander and get lost in your creative process? Um, I suppose I think about it. I suppose in the studio, there's kind of one way that I wander and get lost. And then I suppose on the stage, there's a, another way. But, um, but in the studio, I think for me, because it's quite a solitary um, thing to kind of compose and produce, I'll spend a long time working with one sound in the box in the computer um stretching that sound listening to it in like kind of minute sections maybe um working with different plugins to change that and it sounds kind of dull but for me working with those kind of minute sounds and patterns and really taking something apart and destructing you know kind of being destructive with uh the production can give me a really well it kind of takes me into another world and you know it's the sort of thing where no one could possibly disturb me because you know I'm just in this moment and it's really lovely and I think um that sort of very much comes across in you know quite literally in my production um in my drum programming um so I think that's how I get lost in it um but I suppose you know in a live context it's much more um about getting lost in the moment with the audience and with the visuals so like with my kind of audio visual work it's like the kind of melding of the two things and kind of completely throwing myself into that and I feel like that's a really brilliant thing because it is just in that moment at that show for that one time um so yeah yeah wonderful and Laurie how do you wander and get lost in the creative process um well I think by um trying to uh uh not have a very specific goal or else just be very open to um, going another direction or taking the long way around. So uh, I guess I also, and also by um, welcoming things that go very wrong, you know, that when it just like just goes so south and you're like, oh, this is a mess. I mean, those are the times when I, I it gets my attention and I think, A, how to fix it, or maybe this is really better than the thing I was going for. So, um, uh, and it's always when uh, when people ask like ask me like oh what um, what they should do if their work is stalled you know uh, that's the thing that always uh, a piece of advice that I got from my sculpture teacher Solowit who uh, I love this advice which is basically um, try to do your very worst work. And it's really interesting, you know, uh, because it, first of all, it might have a lot of energy that the work that you're doing just doesn't have, because it's going to, you don't care. It's just going to be the worst thing you could, the stupidest, worst, most naive thing. And then second, at, at the very least, you're going to learn your rules about, I mean, what rules you might have about what's good. And maybe those are rules that are too, you know, fussy. And maybe they could be revised. So I, I think that's that's what I do when I'm trying to wander and I, I get stuck on the same old thing. You know, I, I just 
think, okay, just do something really, really bad. <laughs> And um, over the past 12 months or so, um, I've, I've been experimenting with my own production techniques. I've been putting lots of uh, pedals and, and things and, and doing processing on my sitar. I've, I've been programming a, a, a bit in VR. So I wanted to ask you about what experiments that you'd like to share with that, that you've been doing, like whilst we've been all, you know, pretty much isolated f from each other. Um, Kayla, like what have been your favorite recording and production methods over the past year or so? Um, I suppose I was really making the most, well, making the most of being inside sounds a bit strange, I suppose, but I used to grab loads of sounds um, whenever I was out and about. And whilst lockdown was happening, I think kind of just taking the mic and putting it out the window and being, you know, really being quite restricted, but having to look in different ways at what I was finding um I found that it was kind of like a creative challenge like a little bit like uh, those oblique strategies or something like you can only use sounds from outside your window today and so that kind of thing has been really um quite yeah invigorating for me creatively um but other than that my production hasn't I guess my recording and production hasn't changed an awful lot because I produce at home anyway um, and I don't work with other people unless it's uh, visuals. And I suppose in that sense, we kind of managed to make something work through Zoom. So we we performed um, a live stream show where uh, he put my AV guy um, projected visuals onto an abandoned building. And I did a live set at the same time. And there's a bit of lag and it was a bit weird, but it was really cool. Um, so I suppose just, yeah, thinking about the challenges we had and trying to sort of attack them with creativity rather than feeling blocked by them, I guess was quite useful for me. Yeah. And Hannah, I know that you were producing um, uh, a TV soundtrack, a kind of socially distanced, like, were there any methods that you discovered or, you know, but any creative pathways that really opened up during that process? Yeah, do you know, that was such a scary thing because it was right when the pandemic kind of hit that I had to kind of finish the last few episodes um, remotely so doing the strings remotely and mixing remotely using audio movers and that was all a bit weird but actually I mean it wasn't that bad but the weird thing was like you know when you finish a mix and you're in the studio with your friends or your producer and and you have that moment of like yes and then you, you sit and have a drink or you just kind of like feel the energy in the room and I didn't have that I was just on my own and I just felt really kind of like oh this is so weird <laughs> so it never felt like it got completed until it came out on the tv which is months and months later but i guess you know one of those things that i find we are so quick to adapt and change and and i guess as creatives we come up with with ways of of making that happen and making our dreams become a reality and i think that's a really you know we're using technology in a way to do that it it's it's nice to not fully lose communication with everybody. But yeah, I mean, it's been brilliant getting back in a studio and making stuff for definite. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Laurie, um, I've heard that you've only performed O oh Superman, I believe, a handful of times. And I recently saw it on the NPR Tiny Desk concert and you had Roma on keyboards. Um, what was that experience like? Um, how did it feel performing it out? Oh, um, weird. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't really remember it and and I was in the middle of it oh, I, was, I think I was doing something with my arms in the uh, yeah and you know what I was thinking of doing that was because when I got my vaccination at the Javits Center um, they had a graphic there which is an arm going like this with a band-aid on it and I was like hey that looks like this arm that I used on this uh, record a long time ago and um uh but i i'm not really uh yeah i've only sung that song about six times since the 80s so it was a little <laughs> rusty let's say yeah <laughs> well let's get through some of the chords um it was fun but it, it's uh, you know what happened was recently i did a concert in uh uh, Park Avenue Armory in New York, called, also called Party in the Bardo. It was a really big thing with uh, one of the loudest sounds I've ever heard. We we had a, the place is like a block yeah. tall, a block wide, a block long. And 
this was um, with some of Lou Reed's guitars leaned against amps, so they have this colossal kind of feedback. And then there were a bunch of musicians, some of my favorite musicians playing uh, with it. And um, so during that uh, show, uh, show, I guess, I mean, it was really weird because we outnumbered the, the, the <laughs> production people outnumbered the audience because we <laughs> right. uh, they came in and they, the first thing they had to do was a COVID test. So that's a real warm up for a show, right? Get the COVID test and, and then yeah. they had to wait for their results. It was, it was horrible, you know, it was really very antiseptic. And, uh, but we tried to do some things that were more fun while they waited. And then they came into this big place. Um, and a lot of things happened, but one of the things that happened was the sound was so massive. And, uh, I had a kind of like Satori experience. It was like, it was like all of this, like, like language in the air, massive waves of it. I mean, not, not words, but the, the language that music is kind of and, and banging into people and, and it was invisible. And, but yet it was like making everybody like, wow, I thought this is, this is music. This is the weirdest art form ever. And it was, it's because we've all been listening in little rooms and headphones. We, I forgot that it is like being in a giant ocean, you know, of sound and it was thrilling and, and, and so unfamiliar, you know, uh, I'd really forgotten what it's like to be overwhelmed by the way that sound moves through big spaces, you know, and, and since there are also very few of us, it was not like being at a concert where a lot of the energy is the people. No, it was the, the there were not so many people. And this, it was the sound that was, was like a tsunami. It was real, it was just really, um, one of the, the biggest revelations of my life. Also, oh, this is sound. Oh, the, the, it waves and waves of it that come into you and change you. And it's so physical, you know, you just, whoa. Uh, so that was, that was my, um, my revelation of of that and and uh so since then i've been trying to make some more of these sort of like installations of those of that sound because it it um it has a very very visceral effect we've done this in different music festivals and places around the world and people come in and they're they poke their head into it. whether it's a house or a church i think in the brighton festival it was a church that was like going like this and people like what, why is that church going like that they'd stick their head in the door and they hear this ear bleedingly loud sound and they're like no no not for me and then they kind of go oh let me just check it out and and then they go in and then they stand against the wall for a while like you know blown back and then they kind of like like slide down the wall and like you know because <laughs> it was too much you know and then they'd lie down on the floor for four hours. So in the, in the Park Avenue Armory, we had uh, these pieces of cardboard, really not so comfy, but um, that people could uh, lie down on. They were, not, you didn't have to sit down because uh, you, and a lot of people did lie down and just went, you know, in, into this other place that music could take you. But that you know, sounds yeah. fascinating. So. How did that work? So you had all of Lou's guitars against amplifiers, so it's just like a wall of noise, but would someone come on and individually turn all of them on and, you know, like it, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated. Yeah, no, no, it, it sounds fascinating. There's a guy who's named Stuart Hurwood and he was Lou's guitar tech. And right. he designed a number of things with open tunings. Right. Uh, and they were, and this is, of course, every, every string is tuned to the same note. So right. that means... Some strings are, are like really, really loose and yeah. some are like really super tight. And so when you combine this with the uh, uh, magnets and and guitars and speakers, yeah. cones of speakers, it starts going like, whoa, you know, and creating feedback. So uh, and there was quite a long sort of Stuart is is messianic about this. He just loves doing it beyond anything and loves explaining it. And he's really good at explaining it. 
what feedback actually is. So yeah. when the, when the concert goes uh, after their past, <laughs> you know, and we see, they look at this video of Stuart explaining what feedback actually is, and it's a very very beautiful fifteen minute thing. And and people are like, oh bingo, I know what feedback is now. <laughs> so so you can do different weird things at concerts now that you. I couldn't get away with before, you know, little pre-show things that are weird. And um, I'm not saying now because I think it's that's over. I think that that um, there won't be this kind of uh, um, clinical, you know, uh, testing. There won't be testing. I, I, I hope the testing goes away because I, I, I really being tested in restaurants by waiters who are pretending to be doctors is like just awful you know kind of let me take your temperature 47 that seems good go on you know they don't know anything about what <laughs> temperatures are supposed to be you know you could have a serious problem yeah and be eaten in the restaurant anyway so yeah. that, was, that was a really um so that's how the feedback worked and then the musicians would we would we had 20 different sort of sections that were timed with little clocks and we were because we were we couldn't even see each other you're like a block away from the other musicians they're so far away and um so then we would um have various duets and different things and structures but all improv but still shaped because otherwise it's really it's it's too much it's just like a sound that never stops so we we tried to shape it um, different ways. That sounds absolutely colossal. I mean, I've been to the Park Avenue Armory a few times. So, I mean, it's I'm I keep thinking of like the Futurist Manifesto or something like that. You know, the way they'd all talk about noise and you know I, I don't know it 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 sounds it sounds totally up my street. Um, so um, my mum's actually watching this and we first came to one of your concerts together. My mother's, uh, uh, you know, an, an incredible singer and artist. I wanted to open out this question to Hannah and Kayla. Um, what were your first impressions of Laurie's work? And, you know, like, or maybe like, what questions would you like to ask her? Like, I know Kayla's sent me some, some really fascinating questions. Like, yeah, like, what would you like to ask Laurie, Kayla? Sure, okay. Um, so I guess what I wanted to ask you was about narrative and storytelling. Um, so I kind of write um, with out using lyrics or, or words. And I was wondering a bit about, you know, if you take away the words and, and you're taking away poetry and, and, and all of that, can you kind of create with telling a story without that just through sonics and through visuals? And I, I guess my question to you, um, is how does your work tell stories in, outside of words? You know, how does it tell it in terms of sonic or musical language? You know, it, it's a funny, it's a funny thing because uh, I, I'm struggling with that right now. I, I'm doing a, a big exhibition at a, a museum in Washington D.C., the Hirshhorn Museum, and she shaped like a big donut, and um, it was. Uh, um, uh, it's kind of um, daunting because my my um, medium really is stories more than anything. So, so they don't always work in other other um, media. Like they they don't work very well in visual art, you know. Because if you go through a museum, you don't. It's a real mood breaker to stop and listen to some long story or or piece of music too. They're just not the right places to do those things. They're the right places to do something that is very very immediate and doesn't take you very long. I know when you when you go to like a Biennale and and uh, you you're seeing a lot of these visual works and they're like oh I get it I can see it I can immediately and then you come to the uh, the music section or the video section and you're like oh no no I'm gonna have to stop and go into a little room and listen to music or a video and it's just it's just a, such a different a form of attention you know and, and also in those places usually they're not very good listening situations you know they're not very good speakers or you have to listen to headphones or or the if it's visual then the projection isn't so great so when you you cross um those those boundaries it, it's tough and same thing when you're trying to think of like how to use narrative in a, in a uh, 
piece of music. And of course you can tell um, uh, one in, in pictures, but uh, and I think in, um, in music, it's, it's, um, it's, it probably shouldn't be called narrative, but it could be, it, it is a story. You know, I've, I've heard plenty of pieces of music that are stories with no words. Uh, they're just a different type of story that has many of the same emotions of a story mm -hmm. like have like first of all just like a, a lot of tension and then some kind of you know what, whatever story structure you're using so it can certainly have those things mm -hmm. i i love words though so i'm always trying to cram them into things and um the uh next week i have to go to the museum and and do something with words about about images and it, and it's really making me um uh think about how how those two things relate it's so complicated mm -hmm. you know i i have i've been working with a, an ai group in australia a machine Learn, learning institute and it's really fun one of the programs that they that we're developing is um is uh image to text and so you put an image in and and the the supercomputer generates words um it's a a really interesting way to um i mean it tries to describe what it sees uh, as as we do too when we're trying to um make music or or write words or something too how to how do you put that that thing that you're looking at into another shape sound or picture so um in this uh next week i'm just going to read a lot of stories under a tree where there's a beautiful sculpture by rodin of balzac and Balzac is one of my favorite writers, uh, just because he's, um, you know, he did like 90 books or something like this, all about people's lives. And I think that's another good thing to do when you're stuck is like, try to be a very good observer. And, and Rodin, who did this um, uh, sculpture of Balzac, said, you know, uh, you should um, uh, try to be very um, concrete. Uh, I think it was also, I think Rilke was Balzac's intern and Rilke is one of my favorite poets and he, uh, and, and Balzac was saying, don't be, start being so abstract. You know, what you need to do is you need to go to the zoo and you need to just look at what's there and then you just try to write about that. So he did that and he wrote a, one of the most beautiful poems called the panther and it's about the panther can only see bars he can only, he doesn't even see the world behind the bars and it's something about how he moves behind the bars and, and is unable to see what's back there so great but he got that by just going to the zoo and kind of going how can i see out of a panther's eye aren't you sick out of seeing out of your own eyes all the time you know like so if you saw try to get out of yourself by being a good observer, um, which I think um, you both know of, of uh, as, as being musicians is really a, a, a very helpful thing that you, you try to open yourself to the world and think, oh, how could I make something that has that in it, you know? So uh, I think uh, that was a, uh, and I could see why Balsa, I could see that in Rilke, that he was just a little too abstract, you know, and he should say, get some, get some stuff in there. That's like, like gritty stuff, just messy stuff, life stuff. Don't be so ethereal, you know, we're, we're bodies. So yeah, I thought that was really good advice. Just open your eyes and then try to, um, uh, express it. Uh, just without even your own feelings about it just try to i mean they'll be in there anyway just try to translate it from one um, form to another wonderful um i know hannah you had a really great question about um the record with the chronos quartet would you like to ask the that question yeah uh, yeah i mean i've got so many questions for you laurie <laughs> um, but i guess uh, first before that one of the things that um just leading on from what you were just talking about and kind of inspirational kind of theories and ideas from different people and one of the things that i saw 
a quite a while ago was you talking you were in a garden it's like an interview on youtube and you were talking about being an artist and how never to be you were never felt that like you could be defined within the kind of constraint or a box and and when i heard you talking about that it really offered a massive amount of comfort and changed the way i thought about myself in terms of Oh, okay. It doesn't matter that I play violin and trombone and I did brass bands and I did this and it just, it's an all encompassing idea and, and we kind of, you know, change and float through space and, and make those choices. And I just wanted to say how incredible, you know, that, that quote from you was and, and if there was any other kind of quotes that you've come across in life or not quotes, but kind of picked up an essence from somebody that has, that has changed your pattern or way of thinking? Oh, well, I suppose my biggest, um, one of my biggest influences as, that I'm just gradually realizing is John Cage and how much he had changed the world of not just music, but of, of everything. And, and maybe not through melody or something like that, but because one of my favorite quotes, actually speaking of quotes, is John Adams, who uh, was talking about Cage's most famous work called 433. He sits at the piano and doesn't play for four minutes and 33 seconds, and you just listen to the world. And okay, so the most famous thing. And he said he uh, that in general, he um, wasn't that, he said it wasn't the most interesting music, but it was the most interesting philosophy. So while you think you're doing one thing, you're actually doing another. And, and you're doing all of those at the same time, even when you're uh, uh, playing the uh, flute, trombone, violin, whatever, you know, uh, or I've noticed that when I'm making a painting, I have exactly the same dilemmas and the same uh, uh, questions that I would when I'm writing some music. And that's, is, is it tight enough? Is it loose enough? Is it beautiful enough? Is it mysterious enough? Is it structured enough? Is it um, wild enough? Is it, you know, all of those things. And so you, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Also the, the, the gesture for me of playing the violin is the same as painting things too. So I, the body's in part of it. Um, and same with your mind when you're, when you're going certain directions on a piece of music or when you're like writing and doing music, which are both not really physical things, you can feel the trajectories of your mind going towards that thought, going towards that thought. There are patterns that you have as an artist that uh, sometimes it's good to follow them. Sometimes it's good to interrupt them, you know, so, but both of you know that in terms of, of your work that, that uh, those are um, really interesting problems to to come uh, come across as you're as you're working on things and trying to make it work uh so oh yeah and and yeah Vishy was saying um i was wanting to talk to you actually about landfall because um i find it such a, a massively inspir inspiring album but i guess it's the the context of the memory and and what you're actually addressing but as well the the openness to the sounds and the collaboration with the Cronus Quartet. And um, I, don't, I don't really have a question for it. I just wanted to say how amazing it is. And I, I suppose the, the one thing I've taken from it is that meld that you have of acoustic and technology and addressing kind of massive issues and on, on massive kind of stories as well. And um, yeah, that's, sorry, I don't really have a question. Well, I, it was really fun working with Kronos, and we had a lot of those things because they do a lot of tech stuff. You know, they're not afraid to to do things. So I gave them one of the things that I was working on, which is uh, called Erst, which is like um, a way to to use burst sounds to um, create language. So there was a solo for the second violinist, John Sherber, who was playing like ah, you know, and and he was generating text uh, projected behind them and which you don't get in the record. But that was my favorite part of the piece because it was like the violin was talking to you and he was he was um, uh, doing all the phrases, like all the phrases of language. So what it was is was like, like if you hear somebody like talking in the next room, you can understand their emotion and their, their feeling. You don't hear the words, but you get what the language is about. So 
in that case, uh, he was generating um, uh, this text by his playing, and that that was really a lot of fun for me. And 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 a, they they were very open to to using their extreme chops, and uh, to to also you know work with with some tech stuff. And I'm doing a, in this next month we're recording an orchestra thing in um, Czechoslovakia, uh, and the the um, it's a piece that, that I wrote a while ago for orchestra, which was uh, terrifying because I don't know how to orchestrate it all. And the first time it was played, um, you know how they do that with uh, orchestras, they they don't allow any changes. So they just, you the first time you hear the orchestra play is the day before they're going to premiere it. <laughs> so and this this piece was played and, and, and um, it was uh, uh, Amelia Earhart and uh, so, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, used her pilot logs on her last trip around the world where she crashed and um, or maybe didn't crash as it turns out but um, the when they played this thing everything was wrong every you know the oboes were playing with the cello it was just a mess and I was like that's the worst thing I've ever you know, uh, and the conductor turns around and goes how's that I was like um I was speechless I, I was like and he said a little slower? I said, no, no, no. Faster? Yeah. yeah. Faster. <laughs> Faster. Good. <laughs> but what, here's the thing that I learned from that. The next day, they played that piece with, with an audience. And uh, it was the same piece. It sounded just as bad. But <laughs> at the end of the piece, people applauded as if they heard actual music. I was like, what are you insane? You know, it's like, uh, but because it was presented that way as as music, people said, "Oh, well, that must be music." They didn't question like how poorly it was done, and they thought maybe I wanted that that way or something. I don't know what what it was. I'm sure you've had that so just like, well, are we reacting to your work in ways that you're like, what? Uh, it's like, and and it's interesting because you you know you learn what don't. Do you feel that you had that experience of like learning from your audience in that way or or what people say about what you do? How does that work with you, you two? Yeah, I think it's it's yeah, you definitely get a sense of something because you have your own. Yeah, like your own fears attached to something or, or your insecurities. And yeah, totally. It's either dragged positively or negatively when people start to kind of listen to it or review it or and sometimes you have to kind of have that inner confidence of like exactly that of like, uh, yeah, I wrote it this way. <laughs> it was intended to be like that. <laughs> I wanted it to be like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's an amazing story. Yeah. There's like a violin singing in our computers right now as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> what about you, Tina? Did you have experiences like that from learning from your audience or your critics? <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, it's quite strange, isn't it? I think a similar kind of uh, outcome for me is when, you know, I play something one night and it doesn't go down well at all and you play the exact same thing another night and it's completely different for the audience. But it's like, what is different there? What's happening there that isn't... Um, obviously, I mean, my stuff is it's live, but I'm working with loops and things. So some of those things are predetermined. So they essentially it hasn't changed that much, but it's the sense of what's going on for the audience, how confident I'm feeling, how I'm presenting myself. Do they trust me? And do I trust, am I showing that I trusting my sounds and my skills? I think all of that really feeds into how they respond, but it could also be who was on before me and, you know, any other number of variables. But um, so I, I guess like I try to not, sometimes I take the feedback from the audience too far, too much and sometimes not enough. I think it's really hard to know because it feels fairly random sometimes. Yes, yes, <laughs> you're right. It's the circumstances. You, you think that's not going to change it, and it does. It it really does. It's weird. Mm -hmm. How, um, uh, who? Yeah, like you say, who comes before you? What what the weather is? What your mood is? And mm -hmm. that's the amazing thing about live music is it's so vulnerable to the circumstance. You know, mm -hmm. so it's so live and so real. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that artificial intelligence learning group in Australia, is that the project which is around the Bible? 
yeah yeah okay okay um I heard this wonderful story about some paintings that you and David Bowie collaborated on. Will these be shown in the Hershon? Um... Yes, I decided to put them in there just okay. a few days ago. I thought that would be interesting because it is about crossing stuff. What, what, the, what that was is um, um, David, who was a friend of mine, called me up and said, I think you can read minds. And I said, no, I can't. And he said, I think you can't. I mean, David was a hoaxer and he was always kind of like, <laughs> So he said, okay, we're going to do experiment. You sit by your fax machine. I don't know if you remember fax machines, but they were around and uh, with a pencil <laughs> and a piece of paper. Then I call you up and then put the phone down. We each do a drawing just based on whatever. And then we simultaneously fax these pieces of paper to each other. I said, oh, right. Okay. That sounds okay. I'll do it. Um, and uh the first one that came out we looked at these two drawings none of these are not these are one minute drawings <laughs> okay they're not like works of art there's <laughs> they had you know maybe 10 things in them like a spiral and a whatever and the first one that came out was um, slant in both slanty line uh, a structure that had like a window and a thing coming out of the window and a man hanging by his neck from the window there's no one who could ever tell me that that's not, that's chance. That's not <laughs> chance. Not that way. Does David have a camera? Is he really like in my in my studio or something? Because it was just too weird. So we did a number of these, and they weren't all so you know obviously uh, similar, but they were they were pretty similar. Yeah. And so you know we don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't know how how things work that well you know <laughs> that's like we're we're just working on the surface you know so the great thing about being an artist is you get to like try to go down a little farther than the than the, the glossy surface and see what what there might be there because we we can do a lot more than we think you know Absolutely. Well, I've just got one last question and then we'll take some questions from the Q&A if you know that if you're OK for time. So, um, there was one interview that I watched where you talked about how in your early career you wrote to about 500 European institutions and you sort of talked, you know, you said you had some kind of a tour on and you got two concrete offers from Europe. Um, and one of the reasons that I wanted to put this panel of all of us together is we're all women that have really set our own context and, and, and set our own pace. Um, and so for a last question, what kind, of what kind of encouragement or advice would you give to other artists as they try to make a path for themselves? Um, just uh, don't be polite. <laughs> no. Don't don't do that. You don't have to be polite. Uh, what you, what you were just saying was I I, I was um, working in New York and I really wanted to to uh, do a um, do a tour and I didn't have a tour so I wrote to all these places saying I have a tour coming up and would you like to be part of it? And I had no tour. I had no idea how to do a tour. <laughs> None. And this. <laughs> Maybe three responses out of the 500 people is, yeah, well, I'd like to be part of the tour. And I was like, OK, <laughs> so um, just make it up. Just make it up. Think about what you would really think about what you really, really want. Maybe that's not touring. Maybe what you really want. And then uh, uh, then begin to do it. Don't ask yourself whether you should do it or or don't ask other people to do it for you. Uh, it, just do it, um, and you'll be surprised. I mean, I, I recently one of my dear friends died, and he was uh, such. He was so helpful to me when I was like a young artist, because he was like, his name is Richard Nonus, wonderful sculptor, and he drove me crazy because I kept saying, he kept saying, you just need to do your work, and I said, Richard, that is so impractical. I mean, I, I have to get a, I have to pay for food, I have to get a loft. And he said, no, just do your work. Just do your work. And, and 
and it was making me so um, insane that I, and it, it took me a really a while to think what he meant by that, which was, if it's about what you put first, you know, if you put first getting your rent together, you'll, you'll pay your rent and you'll get your food and, uh, and uh, you may not have time to do your work. If you do your work, and if that's where your best energy is, I promise that everything else will fall in place. I know that that sounds like a stupid promise, but it's really true that put all of your best energy, your best ideas, your best part of your day into your work and wholeheartedly, and then you don't have to ever think about the rest of that stuff. It will just happen because that's, um, because you're you're really trying to do the the hard part, <laughs> you know. I mean, that is the hard part. That's really the hard part to do this. And I'm mean, I'm sorry to use the word work because I don't mean to be such a puritan. You know, it's like uh, work, work, work. You know, it's 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 play. You know, have a, have a wonderful time playing and inventing things and using that en energy uh, uh, to 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 make things and not the energy that is like all the pressures that you feel from other people in the world one of my here's another favorite quote that is about painting and it's about uh, again back to john cage he said you know when you begin a painting everybody's around you or painting any think any work of art everyone's around you your whole family all, all the critics everyone who's ever made a painting everyone from history blah blah, blah is every, and um, you, your your critics, your friends, and you keep and you paint and, and you paint, and then gradually they drift off, and you keep painting and keep painting, and pretty soon there's almost no one there, and pretty soon um, only you are there, and then you keep painting, and then pretty soon you're gone too. And that's how I think it feels to make something. You know, it's a way of disappearing. You know, <laughs> into into like like you were saying at the beginning how do you wander through it uh, and and it's about and you were both talking about how you lose yourself in it that's i think that's a, a way to that you can do it did you ever meet cage i did yeah. yeah i was doing a lot of interviews with him in the last year of his life and um for a buddhist uh, magazine and uh many hours of tapes and and I was so disappointed in this magazine. I'm sorry to say to criticize, but anyway, they said um, we can't publish this. I said, okay, and they said because you didn't really stick to the subject. I was like, you asked the wrong people to stick to the subject. There, there is no subject. What is your subject? You know, what do you mean? You're not even talking about. Um, but anyway, it was it was really nice because what I learned was that this guy is. He was, uh, you know, in such a good mood, and a lot of old people are, are really they're cranky and they're like, they're, I've had it, you know. I just no, nah, no, nah. uh, they're they're bitter or or sad, and he could have been bitter or sad because his his partner had left him, you know. Said I found a nicer guy and I'm gonna be with him. And you're like oh, and so you think well I'm be with somebody in my old age. No, he left. And John was um, one of these people who, who, who looked like this all the time, like <laughs> his tongue was a little bit out, like, uh, and he, he was just happy. He was, he was happy and he was happy to be in the world and happy to be listening to things. And, and he said, well, I, I can't really tour anymore because I can't pick up my bags. And I said, I'll pick up your, I'll carry your bags, you know, and, and uh, he said, okay, and then he, he, he did book one thing, but then he died, so I didn't get a chance to carry his bags, but um, I, I was very, very impressed with his happiness, you know, and his sense of just being so happy to be in the world, and his appreciation of, of things, and, and really just of sounds, you know, he lived on 6th Avenue, and the windows were all open, he was just like, listening to this beautiful ocean of sounds as music so yeah he oh, was that's that's so gorgeous <laughs>
What a wonderful story. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to go over to the Q&A chat box. I've been reading some as they've been popping up. There's some really wonderful questions. Um, there's one from Liam Mice, and, th and this is to Laurie. She says, in Heart of a Dog, you talk about your childhood experience of breaking your back and being told you will never walk again. This, did this experience your influence? Oh, sorry. Did this experience influence your art? And if so, how? Um, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I think uh, I, I was... Um, it, it taught me that you could be optimistic under really um, difficult circumstances also, is that, that I, and I just, um, I guess 12 year old girls are kind of like just natural punks, you know, just have a lot of like uh, um, confidence, you know, the world revolves around me, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's fantastic. Now that does sometimes get, disappear a little bit, but hopefully um, uh, it, it comes back in other ways. And you remember that when you were 12, uh, not that it's great that the world, because the world doesn't revolve around us really, but th that kind of confidence is good, good to remember that you had as a, as a kid. So I, I remember thinking when the doctors told me that I was like, uh, are you really a doctor? I mean, you really know that. I mean, I know I'm going to walk, uh, I'm just, you know, because you're just, because you're a punk. You know, you think adults are idiots. What are they, what are they even telling you? They have these stupid rules. They have, you know, and they're, and they're breaking their own rules all the time too. So you know that they're imposters already when you're 12. You know, you're they're, they're not really, um, you know, if they're breaking their own rules, then what are they doing? telling you what the rules are. So, you know, you're, you're skeptical, you're, you're a natural skeptic. So I think, um, try to channel that natural 12 year old skeptic when you're, when you're, uh, later in the world is getting you down, you know, <laughs> that, that it, from maybe it wasn't when you were 12, maybe it was when you were two, you know, that you were like, Hey, wow. You know, so those are, are, are really important things to remember that you, you can be. Uh, at any point in your life, uh, because you had that experience, you had that experience of, of pure um, joy and confidence, you know, so, so think back to that and, and, and it's in you. So, so you can, you always have that. Wonderful. And I've heard you describe yourself as, as, as a dreamer or, or that you like dreaming a lot. And so there's a, a wonderful question from Laura. What kinds of dreams were you having over lockdown and were they helpful or fruitful creatively? Um, I, I was having kind of chaotic dreams. <laughs> they were just like uh, things that were um, unformed and um, I kind of, yeah, Bardo-like things that were uh, swirling around and um, the, I, I do get a lot of things from dreams once in a while, but that wasn't one period of time that was like that. So I would almost try to recover from my dreams and use my mind to say, you know, it's not that bad. You know, it's, it's really, uh, there are ways that we can move out of this um, situation of, of, uh, of chaos. So... And there's a question from Nicola Dibbon. Um, a few of you have mentioned your work in VR. Would you like to reflect on any creative challenges or insights from working in that medium? Um, Laurie. Well, um, first of all, I, 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 I do have to go in a couple of minutes. Okay, no worries. But I, it's, I, I so much, I'm having so much fun talking to you. <laughs> Oh, it's really great to say, you know, sometimes you forget in the pandemic that you have colleagues and you have like people who have similar issues that you do of making things and what it is to make things. And especially when if it's a different generation, like, like you are from me and it's like nice to like call over the generations, you know, because <laughs> different you know, really in the, in the end. And I also really, um, appreciate, um, the um energy of women making music because that's uh 
that's a, a very powerful um, thing. We have very different things to say. I mean, I, I know that we have a lot in common with men, but we have we have a very different perspective. For example, I mean, I just wish there were more operas on, or any operas on, uh, not that I'm an opera fan, I'm not really, but let's say I was, and uh, <laughs> it would be nice to have stories, let's say, about women and mothers. Think of all the countless things about fathers and sons and that you have through history of plays and novels and operas and that kind of energy. But we have things that are things the world hasn't heard and we're beginning to be the artists. So these are stories that are no one has heard from that point of view. Yeah. So this is a, an, an incredibly exciting time to be uh, a woman and an artist. This is a really wild time. It's because uh, here comes the other side of the human race with our stories. And uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Laurie, thank you so much. This has been, I felt like I've just been floating for the last hour or so. And it's its just been so wonderful to talk to you. I'd, I'd love to recreate this in person in London one Let's day. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Well, Seeing, seeing as you have to go, shall we? Shall we bid you farewell? I'll, I'll, I'll draw this panel to a close, and then I'll do my little closing speech for everybody. But, um, Laurie, thank you so much, sincerely. Um, thank you from all of us, Kayla, Hannah. Mm -hmm. If you want to say, say, or say anything. Yeah, just yeah. thank you. Sorry, Hannah, you go. No, no, no. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Kayla, it's really fun to be with you. So it's nice great. to meet you. Thank yeah, you. Same. Laurie. same. See you. Okay. See you very, very soon. Thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Well, wow. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just collecting myself there. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that we could only answer a few questions, but I think we all got more, you know, more than we could have asked for. Really. I mean, I mean, how do you feel, Kayla and Hannah? I hope I like that was more than I. That's kind of more than I could have ever asked for. I love Laurie. I know, I did. <laughs> She's like the most amazing woman. She's like a, a female Yoda. She's I like, know, completely. Just, yeah, I just was like, I want to hug you and I want to cry at the same time. I know, <laughs> I know. So lovely to chat. Thank you. I was, I was looking at all of our faces and we were all like, we were all like this. Just like absolutely <laughs> blissed out. I wonder how it was looking for the audience. Um, but but anyway, thank you, Hannah and Kayla, for not only just being two artists who you know I, I love and admire, but for I feel like we're on a plane. We're friends. I just yeah, I'm just thank you both so much. Um, I'd like to thank Hinako Omori and Helena Arise for their beautiful um, commissions. Um, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for being so attentive and wonderful and staying with us solidly for the last couple of hours. Um, I'd love to thank everybody uh, at which it's been a very small but very dedicated team. This is the first time I've actually had this kind of a team around me. So Bella, Terry, Yulia, Andy, Leanne, Jim, Emma, thank you, everybody. This has been an absolute dream putting this together. I'd like to thank our support from the Rattle and the Creative Party Passport, and to our sponsors, the PRS Foundation, the Featured Artists Coalition and Ableton. Um, all the social links are in the chat. I believe that the chat is something that you can save. We're now going to move to the after party environment in Topia. Please do come. I'll be there in about five minutes time after I've just had a sip of water. And um, yeah, thank you. That's it for Witch Digital 2021. This has been brilliant. My name is Bishy, the creator, curator, founder. But more than anything, just somebody who loves to bring people together and I love to foster creative connection. And uh, thank you all so much. This has been an absolute joy. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.